Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Uh, I'm with Richard Martini. He's an American film director, producer, author, and he's an expert on what happens when we pass in the afterlife. I'm always asking the question, what happens when we die? Well, he's researched thousands of cases of near-death experience, past life regressions under hypnosis. He's the author of a handful of books, maybe more. Some of them are called the author of the the author of the book, uh, Architecture of the Afterlife, Hacking the Afterlife, and it's a wonderful afterlife. Richard, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Hello, Hello Roberto. Ciao. How are you? I'm great. Um, cool. So how do we have proof that there is an afterlife, that when this is over, it's, it's not just the end of, and our spirit or consciousness continues on? Well, I'll tell you, in terms of my research, um, I had a friend come through from the other side and connect with me. And when that happened but back in 96, I thought, oh, I must be imagining this. And I really hadn't thought about ghosts or any of that stuff. I mean, I had experienced them, but I always thought, oh, it's your imagination. But this was my friend. And she was, I could hear her voice. Sometimes I could see her. But she was appearing as a younger version of how I knew her. So I thought, okay, that's strange. And then I got a gig working on the Charles Grodin show in Manhattan back in 97. And Charles Grodin and I are friends, and he was friends with this girl. And so we invited James Von Prague onto the show, one of the mediums who claims to talk to the flip side. There's a clip of the moment when Robert, or when James Von Prague is on the Charles Grodin show where he connects with my friend Luana Anders, which is on my page, martinizone.com. But in that clip, you'll see um, James von Prague, we had arranged for, my, for me to call in from an outside location. Von Prague didn't know that, Chuck Roden did. So he put me clear, you know, straight through to James von Prague. Von Prague started saying, he started talking about my friend and a number of things, very specific details that no one knows. But the most important thing was, he said, she's telling me you have a photograph on your refrigerator that's the essence of your relationship. And when I put that photograph on the fridge, I had said aloud, oh my God, the essence of our relationship. In Rome, having cappuccinos, eating cookies. But I'd never said it about any photograph oh, I'd ever put wow. up in my life. And when he said that, you know, that thing in the back of your neck would go, and you go, yeah. oh, I'm getting it right now. That's verification that something, right? And then he said, you know that thing in the back of your neck when you get that? That's her verifying that you're on the right path. So that put me down this weird path. And for about 10 years, I kind of researched it. She had been a Buddhist, so I thought, oh, maybe Buddhism has something to do with it. I went to Tibet with Robert Thurman, Uma's father, former Tibet monk. But it didn't turn out that even though Buddhism is quite accurate about reality when it comes to the afterlife or life goes on life, it isn't. So I started a documentary called Flipside where I started filming people under deep hypnosis accessing their loved ones. And I focus on new information, which is information that can't be cryptomnesia, something you saw or read or was on TV. And one of the cases I examined when I first started out was an Oxford professor whose daughter had died, and I recommended this kind of research. And he had a session in London where he saw his daughter. I mean, only he could claim that. You know, he felt to him as if he was holding her hand, and she explained, you know, what happened and why it happened and blah, blah, blah. But at some point on the way into seeing his daughter, he had a past life memory. And in the past life memory, he recalled being married to a girl that he was deeply in love with back in 1840 in Boston. What he told me afterwards was it was unusual because he knows this girl in this life. He met her briefly in the 1960s. They had a fling. You know, they were not together a long time. But here in this past life memory, he's seeing her. That's like my soulmate. And I said, well, are you still friends with her? He said, yeah. I said, all right, well, don't tell her anything about your session. I arranged for this woman who lives in another country to do a session with a hypnotherapist, and she had the identical 
past life memory of being married to this guy in 1840. Wow. So, and just in terms of mathematical, theoretical constructs, it's not possible to, to, to measure that. But that aside, so I've been filming, I've filmed over 50 people accessing past lifetimes that I was able to forensically verify, at least some of the details. Um, people under hypnosis talking to their loved ones on the other side. What they say about the other side is not religious. It doesn't go in line with any religion or any philosophy or any science that I've ever come across. It's contrary to all of that, but it's consistent. So that's what I've been working on. And then somewhere along the line, a medium reached out to me, uh, Jennifer Schaefer, who works with law enforcement nationwide on missing person cases. She said, I love your work. I think we should meet. And I was like, mediumship, uh, yeah, I'm not interested in predicting the future, and blah, blah. I just didn't know what it was. Yeah. And I realized it's like having a cell phone <laughs> to the other side because Jennifer is so good at what she does. I started dialing up friend Luana, friends of mine who had passed away. And by doing that, I already know details, you know, about their life, what happened. So not only was she verifying those things, but then friends that they were friends with were coming forward. So Luana, who was an actress who was in tons of shows, she had a lot of friends who came through and they wanted to talk to us. They wanted to pass, a, learn the process, and which is kind of counterintuitive. But this is what we've learned. When they check off the planet, they don't at first realize that they can still communicate. They know they still exist. We don't. What, They're not omniscient. Think, what, 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 this is a, the, probably the trickiest question, but it just came to my mind. Why do you think God or the great spirit or whoever the designer was of our reality <laughs> made it so that we're not supposed to contact the dead, that we're supposed to question this light. And, 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 Wait, and, let me get him on the phone. Elon? <laughs> Elon, listen, uh, he's asking whether or not, what's the thing? Okay, all right, here's what he says. So, as a sidebar for this research, I've realized I get a chance to understand how consciousness works in relation to the history of the planet. So it's a good question. So why don't we remember our previous lifetimes if we've had them? Like, wouldn't it be wise if we could? Well, some people do. We don't really pay attention to them. They're usually little people up till about the age of eight. Many children, many, some children recall previous lifetimes. They talk about it with their parents or they see their grandparents or they have events that are outside our parameters. About the age of eight, those events start to disappear. They stop accessing that information. What happens at the age of eight? Well, the skull hardens. So it may be a frequency issue. So let's hold that aside, frequency issue. What people claim under hypnosis is, is that we bring about a third of our conscious energy to a lifetime. So Robert, Richard, we're back home and we carve off or pour out like a third of who we are into a cup and we pour that cup into the human being. So the human being grows up, becomes the person that they are. And at the end of that journey, when this part falls, fails, that energy that goes back to the other two thirds that was always left behind. This is what people say consistently. So why is it we can't access that information? I noticed that uh, there's a great scientist named uh, Dr. Bruce Grayson. He's from the University of Virginia. He's been studying near-death experiences for a long time. He has a talk called, Is Consciousness Produced by the Brain? And in the talk, he talks about those filters, how it appears that some part of the brain accesses that information, but it filters most of it out. It might be because we would run into walls or, you know, we wouldn't be able to navigate the planet if we could, everybody that we saw was like, yeah, you killed me in a past lifetime. I'm going to kill you, whatever. Yeah. But 
his evidence is that 70% of the cases in the UK of dementia, the hospice care workers report that just prior to passing their patients suddenly recall spontaneously all their memory, 70%. So so a few minutes, hours, sometimes days before they die, suddenly, oh, I know who you are, and I know who that was, and oh, I see my dead brother standing there waiting for me. They access all this information, but when they do the autopsy, the brains had atrophied to a point where they weren't capable of remembering anything. So it's like the filters die. And now the second part of that is I was doing some research, and the uh, psychologist, Dr. Helen Wamba, who wrote a couple of books, um, Reliving Past Lives, I recommend, back in the 70s. She had a case study of 2,000 clients. And what she did that was different and unique from other people like Michael Newton and the Newton Institute, she, had, she did it in a clinical fashion. She had a group of people come into a room, ask them to recall some previous lifetime, and as they went back in time, she asked them to focus on the details. What kind of utensils you used, what kind of clothing you wore. These are forensically verifiable details. So then when she could do the forensic research, so a fork went from two prongs to three prongs at a certain time, you see? Or clothing went from, you know, what a wool to cotton. Or building materials changed. So she was able to forensically verify that, and then she asked them more profound questions which they say the same things that the Newton cases talk about. Choosing your lifetime, why they chose a lifetime, choosing a gender, choosing a sexual orientation, choosing who you're going to be in this lifetime, which includes choosing parents. So, but she also, within that material, boom, I see it. She says her theory is that the brain, the right brain and left brain together, the right brain gets all that information and the left brain, which is hypervigilant, filters out the information that's not conducive to the human to survive. So like, if, like a receiver, you turn on the receiver, if you got all that information, all your past lives, everything that you've done, every, everything, you would probably have a hard time navigating the, the life, this life. And if you look at the cases of I, at IONS, International Association of Near-Death Studies, there's thousands of cases of people having near-death events. They often, and I've spoken at many of their groups, they often express this difficulty of navigating the planet once they come back from the filters being off. They go back home, they see unconditional love, they see this all as like a stage play, and then they come back in and, and it, they're, you know, you have to go back and finish the play. And, and they get back here and they're like, no, I don't want to be here. I don't want to fight. I don't want to argue. I just want to be home. I want to go back home. And that, by the way, is the one thing that popped out in the research. The very first person that I filmed under deep hypnosis, the hypnotherapist said to them, so what happened that day you died, you know, that you're recalling? traumatic event. And she said, well, I went home. And when she said that, I thought, does she mean Schenectady? Or does she mean Warsaw, which was the life that she had just recalled? Okay. But she, she meant neither. She meant home. It's over my shoulder. Home, the place we all start at before we choose to come here. Which then kind of takes us into your field, which is if this is how incarnation works, we bring about a third of our consciousness to a life. What about those people who don't choose a lifetime here on the planet? In Michael Newton's research, one third, over 30%, and I've heard it's more than that, people recall lifetimes off planet not here you mean in different planets different planets different realms different universes different environments sometimes completely underwater completely submerged now 
I'd heard that. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> but in my weird research, so the first 50 cases that I filmed, I'm in the back of the room. I'm just filming. The hypnotherapist asks the questions. So I might, you know, pass a note and say, here, ask him what street he grew up on. But for the most part, I'm listening. When I started this other weird avenue, it was to talk to people like yourself. Perhaps they'd had a dream or a vision of some kind, and I'd walk them back into the dream. And I use that as a gateway, like a key to get to the other side. And they, people like Dr. Drew, who doesn't believe in the afterlife, but we did this live on the air where I said, let's go and talk to your guide. And he went, what's my guide? And I said, don't look, don't worry about it. Just look around. You see any, and he did, he saw somebody. And then I said to the guide, can we go talk to Dr. Drew's counsel? And Dr. Drew said, what's my counsel? And I said, I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to your guide. I knew the guide knew what his counsel was. And then we were in this room and Dr. Drew was saying, oh my God, there's all these people in this room. I don't know who they are, but that one's dressed like this. And, and then I start interviewing the council members. And this is my point. Some of the council members don't look like me and you. And when they, people will say that, some of them are like, you know, this is weird. I'm looking at a person who looks like an alien. And I'll say, well, hold on, you know, go up and hold their hands. Let's ask them a question. And, and I'd ask the council member, have you ever incarnated on planet Earth? And they'll say, no. I'll say, have you ever incarnated with our friend here somewhere else? And they'll go, yeah. Can you show that to our friend? And the next thing you know, they're talking about a planet Sometimes they say specifically where it is, you know, it's off past Antares. Some of them say it's not in this universe, it's in another universe. But yeah, we're much higher intelligence over there. I actually had one council member say, because I said, have you ever incarnated as a human? And he said, I wouldn't stoop that low. Oh my God. Um, so that <laughs> answers my big question that I asked you before the show. What do extraterrestrials have to do with our life? And they have a big part to do with our life because they're in the mix with us, you're saying, basically. Well, not only that, but I think the sentence is, and I heard this from somebody that we were interviewing on the flip side, on a physicist. And I said to him, you know, what about aliens? And he said, we're all aliens. And I said, clarify. And he said, well, if you think about the incarnation process, we are this conscious energy that chooses to incarnate as a being, and we learn the lessons from that lifetime as a being. But when you run into somebody who's not, doesn't look like you, they're not worse or better or either way, they're just another being that chose that journey. And so then the question is, is, well, when are we going to be able to, to communicate with those beings? I mean, or should we? I mean, is that going to be a problem? Or is it a cookbook? <laughs> you know, are they fattening up? In my case, probably. Your case, not so much. But the answer is no. Eventually, we will. And what you're doing, this is, I heard this just recently, what you're doing, having people listen to this and sort of unfocus their mind and allow that there's a possibility what I'm saying is accurate, that there is an afterlife, that there might be other beings that aren't malevolent. If that's possible, that forces the human mind to lift the filters a little bit. So you don't need a near-death experience. You don't need LST. You don't need to have guided meditation or a hypnotherapist session, they all help. But just talking about it allows us to open ourselves up to the possibility. Of possible communication. Yeah, exactly. Or put it this way, how do we communicate in dreams? How do, how do you typically communicate in a dream? Um, 
you you're talking uh, the reason why i didn't hear your whole thing is you cut out for a second or two and i didn't want to interrupt you oh but interrupt um, me. Go ahead. How, Sorry. How we, so how do we communicate in dreams um you usually just you hear someone talking to you i mean you just hear it in your dreams right and sometimes you talk back to them right yeah you communicate yeah but none of it is sound waves right unless your girlfriend or your wife is like, I heard you mumbling last night. But I, you know what I mean? It's all a construct. You're hearing sound, but you're not hearing sound. Because how does sound show up in your brain? It's a wave that hits your ear, that goes to your brain, that goes to the link in the computer that says, Robert's talking. Oh, I know Robert's voice, that's Robert. When you're dreaming about Robert, I hear you speak and my brain goes, oh, that's Robert's voice. And now we're having a conversation, even though both of us are sound asleep. So communication in dreams is very similar to what we're talking about because the more I ask people questions on the flip side, like how do you communicate over there? They'll say it, we don't, use language it's limiting it's too limiting if i want to express a thought to you i'll reach out and grab your hand or grab your energy and i'll impart the entire download like that wow and i'll give you one example it's in the book backstage of the past to the flip side three me and jennifer schaefer talking to people on the other side and Often I'll say, whoever wants to show up, come on. And she says, Dick Clark is here. And I say, why? I don't know Dick Clark. I didn't know him. I met, I knew Merv. I was yeah. on the Merv show. That's on my page. But I, you know, and I'm like, Dick Clark, what does he want to tell us? And he started talking about the vibration of music and how music carries much more information than we think it does. And this is related to how we communicate vibrationally, frequency wise. And I say, I always ask the same questions. Who was there to greet you when you cross over? What do you miss about being on the planet? And his answer to that relates to this, which is he said, I miss the mystery. When you come up to a person on the planet, you don't know anything about them. You learn about them while talking to them while as, you know, accessing their information and they reveal themselves to you a little at a time. On the flip side, it's a download. So oh, you're wow. running a Dick Clark and he knows everything about you. You know, all the lifetimes you've had, what it is you were trying to do, what you tried to accomplish, that time you picked your nose in third grade. He knows it all, you know, and it's, in, it's too much information. But let's just say, you can't shield information the way you do here, the way people do. Yeah, and, and then they, I guess, we're able to handle that in, in that load of information. Like, like our, our computers or our consciousness is able to- Apparently maintain. so, yeah, big time. Now, That's amazing. Well, people, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, well, no, I'm just gonna say people aren't, they don't claim to be omniscient. So they get back to the flip side. This always comes up in channeling. You know, somebody says, I was channeling Seth, for example, or channeling, they always have kind of funny names. And the channelers generally, which I find amusing, suddenly start speaking with a weird tone in their voice and it sounds very strange, their chat. I mean, why not just speak normally? You're just yeah. getting information. You're not getting, you know, a, char a character, but, Let's just put it this way, and uh, no offense to channelers or the people that they channel, but those folks are not omniscient. They're aware of all of their lifetimes, which is a lot, and they're aware of all of our lifetimes, which is a lot. But when you say to them, you know, why did, you know, blah, 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 you ask a godlike question, and they'll say, that's above my pay grade. I haven't, I'm not aware of the answer to that. In general, channelers aren't used to saying i don't know 
But to me, it's the most refreshing thing when I hear somebody on the flip side say, I have no clue. Why don't you ask somebody? Or they'll say, hold on a second. I'm going to bring in Albert or, you know, Stephen Hawking. He can answer that question because they can. So it's not that different than it is here on, on some mundane level. I know that sounds wacky. But, for example, my friend Bill Paxton, who, when he passed away, um, great friend. And I had three different mediums talk to him directly, ask him questions about the journey. And it's, uh, it's on Gaia called Talking to Bill Paxton. But I did ask him this, which was, so, Bill, what do you want me to tell your fans or, you know, your friends? Or, like, what's one thing? And he said, tell them I can fly. And what he meant by that was, you can move at the speed of thought. So if I say, Robert, wow. meet me in Paris. We're going to go to that cafe, the Cafe du Monde, or whatever it is. We're there. We think of it, and we both travel there. Other people can't see us. Maybe cats. A couple of cats can see us. And maybe a child. Yeah. But in general, we're there sitting in the cafe, looking around. We can create the cappuccino because it's a construct. Remember? The construct, it's like sound. You can create yeah. taste and flavor. Eh, but not quite the butteriness of a croissant. Harder to do, let's just say. And if I may say, Robert, you know that this pandemic we're in includes telling people not to what? Uh, uh, sit be together um, and something to do with lungs oh smoke smoke <laughs> i'm not going to be your parent but i will say oh, don't do that i well i think i quit i quit smoke and i started Dude, vaping, vaping uh, and smoking set that thing yeah, I know. down I, all right here's what all here's right. what's weird robert and I wouldn't even mention it, but my research is very strange. And in the book, Architecture of the Afterlife, I demonstrate how many people, when I'm talking to them about, you know, going to visit their council, I'll, I'll say like, can we go to a place of healing? I just call it that. And they'll say, oh, I'm in this room and I see this golden light and it, I feel really fantastic. But most often they say, I'm in a forest, I feel, that I'm standing in this grove and I can see these magnificent trees and I can feel and I can smell the oxygen, right? And then I say, because I'm weird, I go, can you go over and put your arms around one of those trees? And they'll say, yeah. And then I go describe that and they go like, wow, it's weird. I feel like an energy associated with the tree, something like a sentience. And then I'll say, and I've done it many times, can we talk to the tree? And they'll say, I don't know why, but I'm hearing an answer. <laughs> yes. What do you want to know? And I say, who are you? What's your story? What's your thing? What's your journey? How did you come to be here? How many lifetimes have you had as a tree? How many? And it's fascinating because the that perspective, one tree said that, uh, he had lived 625 years on the planet, that he regarded humans as insects crawling up and down because for 600 years of watching what they do, it's, to them, it's like insects moving around. But when asked, wow. when asked, I mean, you think of trees. Tree, it's literally the image, the mirror image of your lungs. If you look at a lung, they're trees. Yeah. And they're, they function opposite, right? Because you take in oxygen, you expel food for the trees. The trees soak in what you expel, and they create the thing you breathe. We're in that weird symbiotic relationship. So when I asked simply, how do we help the planet? How do we help with climate change? I've heard this consistently which is strange, plant a trillion trees. And wow. the, reason, the reason for that is because 
more oxygen cools the planet down. Oh, wow. all the trees we've killed. We're going to bring the oxygen level up. It's funny because today I read some counter uh, science to that, like, don't plant a trillion trees because you'll screw this up or whatever. Listen, I'm not making this claim. I'm not a scientist. I'm, I'm just a reporter. I'm a filmmaker. Yeah. I'm a reporter reporting. And I'm telling you, the freaking tree told us to plant a trillion trees. Not me. Yeah. So got an argument with the tree? Take it up with him. I can't believe that a tree is an actual sentient being. What is it? What else did it say? Not only trees, my friend. Well, I'm, are you familiar with Native American culture, religion, stuff like that? So that's the only religion. I, I want to be more familiar with it. Okay. Well, you've heard of the great spirit, right? You've heard that term. Yeah. Wakantanka in the Sioux language. Basically, the concept is that everything is conscious. Everything is composed of the great spirit, whether it's your cell phone or whether a rock or water. It's counterintuitive to our thinking because we think of brains as associated with lives. But ask any scientist, a pen is atoms agreeing to hold space together. Now, if you could ask an atom, like, why are you agreeing to do that? Why would you do that? Why would you? participate in that reality. And you start to look at quantum mechanics and quantum research in terms of how consciousness influenced certain events, scientific quantum entanglement events. You start to see that consciousness, that thing, whatever it is, and I don't mean, I don't mean whatever it is. I mean, what it is, is pretty much everything that we experience. You know, dark matter, dark energy, likely consciousness. Everything is consciousness. Everything's connected. That's why we're connected to everybody and everything. But when it comes to specific individual entities that people are seeing while I'm talking to them, I will ask the same question. You're holding a rock, right? Somebody says, I'm, you know, like I'm looking at this creek and I see these rocks in a river and I go, pick up a rock. And then I'll say, you feel anything? Or get a hold of that water. Put the water in your hand. Or do you feel any kind of presence associated with that water? And every time they say yes. And so then I'll ask specific questions. The most interesting ones are when I ask animals. Because their perspective of us is really unusual. You know, a tree. What, what is their perspective? Because they don't get to move. What do well, animals say about us? Animals say that they're completely aware of the process, that we are not. They know that they reincarnate. They know who we are. They seek us out. If they've been friends of ours in a previous lifetime, they report. I'll, I'll give you an example. Jennifer Schaefer and I have been done a number of interviews with this Oscar nominated dog, there's only one. And this dog was nominated for writing. He was in, he inspired the screenplay for the movie Greystoke. But his name is in the credits because the author, Robert Town, took use his name. But we've had a number of very unusual conversations with Hira. And Hira correctly talked about things that only I knew or that Robert knew. For this example, is dog. this is the dog. So the way it worked was we were having a conversation with Robert Town. We, Robert and I were doing a Skype session with Jennifer, and we were talking to a guy named Ed Taylor who had passed away. And Eddie came through, and he was saying, thank you for scattering my ashes on the boat. I mean, very specific, accurate things. And I suddenly said, can we talk to Hira? And Robert said, can we do that? And Jennifer said, why am I seeing a giant white shag rug? And I said, because that's what he was. He was a commandor. His, you know, his with hair was like rug. So yeah. I 
started asking him questions. And he answered stuff that only Hira could know. And I was there when, for example, Hira recounted when I drove him 18 hours to the set in Eugene, Oregon. Jennifer wow. said, he's showing me you guys in the back, back, me and him, in the back of a convertible. Anyway, other details, but the most specific one was when he remembered the time that he confronted a buffalo in Catalina. And he showed Jennifer the buffalo. She said, I'm seeing him confront a buffalo. And Robert, I wasn't there, but Robert was when he had taken his dog over to the island of Catalina and they have buffalo over there and the dog had challenged this buffalo and the buffalo's attitude was like, what's this? Those kinds of weird um, verifications have bled into my other work in Architecture of the Afterlife. I was doing an interview on Skype with a scientist in Chicago and we were accessing she had had a near-death experience, and so we went back and went through it, and Steph Arnold. And when we got to a certain point, I asked her council member if she was aware of my work. And the council member said, yeah, many of us are, some were not. And I said, can I ask you, how are you aware of me and my work? I mean, you're sitting around the cooler, you know, the water cooler on the flip side. Yeah, that martini guy's here. And she said, she said, I'm aware of you through your dog. And she showed Stephanie, my dog, part Collie, part German Shepherd. And believe me, I froze. Oh. My mind blew. My mind screeched to a halt. And I said, are you, are you kidding? You're joking. And she said, I know you're not going to believe me, but I know you through your dog. My dog died 40 years ago. This is a woman wow. that I'm meeting online six months ago. She showed, anyway, and then Jennifer and I interviewed my dog, and my dog told me new information, like he had seen my brother just before he died. And my, I called my brother up. It's like, hey, did you see Sam? You know, I was living in Italy and he was like, yeah, didn't I tell you that? No, never had. So not only wow. are trees sentient, every freaking animal you've ever owned. I got a big question. You. Yeah. Do, do animals, do, do, have you ever asked them, do they prefer being animals or do they ever get a chance to incarnate in just as a human? Or we don't know that. Well, it's funny that we would think of it in terms of higher or lower. That is what the Buddhist and some reincarnation religious beliefs are, that, you know, there's this hierarchy, you know, you become more and more and more. That's not in the research. What is in the research is that we choose our lifetimes. The people who choose more difficult lifetimes are generally older souls because they claim they can handle them, handle it. So the people that you see are homeless and hanging on the street may very well have said, I can handle this. I'm going to teach some profound lessons in love when I get over there. I'm just saying that is in the research. In terms of animals to humans, it's almost zero. I mean, in all the cases I've studied, there was one case where a hypnotherapist said that a girl had come in and she recalled a previous lifetime as a fox. And, <laughs> and so, and he was incredulous because he had been doing thousands of cases and never had anybody. But the way that he tested it was to ask her while she's under hypnosis, can you recall the life previous to the fox line? And she recalled being an Arctic fox, like another fox. So oh, it's all wow. the, so in that concept, you could argue, well, she went up the ladder. But here's the thing. The reason we, and this is important to sort of discuss about incarnation or choosing our parents. You don't just choose your parents. You're in a life planning session with everybody. And the auditorium is filled with thousands of people. I've filmed many of these, had experience myself. And 
and perhaps on stage, it's you, Robert, and your mom and dad, and brothers and sisters, and your immediate family. But everybody in the audience is all going to be part of the journey. And they all, all agree to do so. They all agree to play the role of the guy who runs into your car. And we have free will, so we can screw it up, so it doesn't, it's not laid out in cement. But generally, they're actors agreeing to play that role. So if you were going to incarnate as a dog or a cat, you'd have to get the permission from all of their siblings. You see? To step into the, their paws, yeah. you'd have to get everybody to agree. Like, why? what are you going to learn from that? Because each time, you could argue, is a gift. Each time is like an incredible lesson. And we argue with our teachers and guides and say, look, let me go. I want to come back. I, I'm going to learn that thing that I said I was going to learn before. This time, I'm not going to screw up. And everybody's going to help me to become the person that I really want to be. And then we get here and, you know, cut to drugs, whatever, heroin. And you're like, what was I thinking? I hate it here. Whatever. You know, I know it's hard for people to hear me say this, especially in light of trauma. You know, people who have experienced trauma, deep trauma, they don't really, it's hard to put their minds around that the trauma may, not definitely, but may have been designed to learn a profound lesson because anyone will tell you, you know, the best doctors are the ones who experience trauma. The best teachers are the ones who've experienced had a journey that's been much more profound. So there you go. That's amazing. And then what what do you um what are your feelings about like and what have you learned about this about like an ultimate creator or a creator of all or a god? Oh yeah, you mentioned that dude earlier. Oh wait, let me get him on the phone again. Do we want to tell Robert about the God thing? Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that's the first time I've ever used that joke. Um, it actually feels kind of new. Here's the thing. It's good. <laughs> but here's the thing. Um, I did have an experience with God. Let's just call it that. I get it. No, how else to put it. I wasn't having the experience, but I was in the room when somebody else was. And here's how it went down. A very skeptical friend of mine, a film producer, um, agreed to do a Between Life session with Scott at lightbetweenlives.com. So I drove her out to the Scott's office. And on the way there, she said, you know, I don't believe in the afterlife. I don't believe anything you've told me. I said, well, wh why are we doing this? She said, well, I'm having an operation on my ovary. And the doctor told me hypnosis is a good way for me to chill and relax. I, he was thinking of something else. But anyway, I said, do you have any questions if, in case we get to a teacher or talk to some guide or something? She said, there are no guides. I'm not going anywhere. I said, all right, come on. Let's just come up with a couple of set, couple of questions. She said, okay, what or who is God? That's, you know, the skeptic's question. And I was like, great. So now we get to the session. She slips her questions to Scott, no context. Scott talks her into a previous lifetime. I mean, talks her back into a relaxing spot. And then she recalls a lifetime in 1820. I mean, I was literally able to look it up while she was talking about it. But it was very profound, this lifetime. And then she moved into the life between lives and at some point was talking to a wise guide, like an ancient wisdom person. And Scott said, okay, can we ask your guide this question? what or who is God? And the guide said, oh, you humans, you think by naming things, it's going to give you a better handle on them. Let me tell you, God is beyond the capacity of the human brain to comprehend. It's not physically possible, he said, but you can experience God. And when he said that, it's always been one of my arguments, like you can talk about skydiving, you can talk about hypnosis, but unless you've tried it, you can't, there's no words for it. I mean, 
skydiving is swimming and falling and flying at the same time. But if you haven't done it, it's just blah, blah, blah. So when he said yeah. that, you can experience God, I sat up. He said, you can experience God by opening your heart to everyone and all things. Since that time, I've broken that down in many, many, many different ways. It's a very simple sentence. Almost impossible to do. Open your heart to everyone. Nobody can do it. We live in a planet where a guy picks up a gun, you're like, somebody yells at you. Somebody cuts you off in traffic. Somebody makes a bad coffee. <laughs> Your heart is not open. We even on the pulpit, they, they don't talk about it. They just say, I mean, it's unconditional love. That's what opening your heart to everyone is, unconditional love. I found it in the research all the time. People having a near-death experience, people between life experience, under a deep hypnosis, they claim I'm experiencing profound, unconditional love. When they talk about going home, which is what they all say, I ask, what's home me? And they go, oh, it's a place of no judgment, of unconditional love. So when this guy said this, open your heart to everyone and all things. And you realize, oh, he's also talking about the great spirit. Because if you open yourself to all things, if things are equal to humans or events are equal, to each other, bad, good, and different. We can look at it from a perspective of, this was all part of the journey that we're taking together. It's all part of experience that we've all agreed to sign up and do. And that becomes this kind of bizarrely, acknowledge, bizarre acknowledgement of consciousness being what or who God is, or you know, being connected to everything and everybody. One person that we've accessed frequently in our research, me and Jennifer, is Robin Williams. I met him once, had dinner with him, but really? when he showed up, yeah. And when he showed up, the first few times I was like, wow, this is wild. And then of course I wanted to ask him about suicide. I wanted to ask him about all kinds of things. But ultimately I wrote a chapter about him for Hacking the Afterlife. And then I was looking at the chapter and I thought, you know what, this is about me. Not about Robin, you know, about how I had dinner with him and where I met him and da 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 da. So I took the chapter out. And the next time I met with Jennifer, she said to me, Robin's here and he wants you to put the chapter back in. <laughs> and I was like, how could she? Is she in my head? Like, is she in my computer? How did she know that? And since then, he shows up quite a bit. So let me just quote him on this topic of God which is often we ask him, like, do you have any words of advice for people? And his thing is to say two words, love, love, <laughs> love, love. Meaning that's amazing. Love everything about it. Love what it is, love what it could be, what it means to you, love others, love the idea of love. That's how we're on the planet. We're here to share love, to find unconditional love, to experience unconditional love, to realize that all of us are connected, that I should love the, my enemy. And uh, once, if I could see my enemy, I would realize I do love my enemy. I'd ask my enemy to play the role of my enemy. So that's this who God is. Amazing. Not a fella. Not a guy, not a guy in a car, or a guy riding a horse, or a guy with a beard. Some people will see a avatar of that and say, I think I saw God. Well, if you ask them, what did you experience? They'll say, unconditional love. So that's how we let That makes a lot of sense. It. it does to me. And, you know, look at me. Do I make any sense? I don't know. Look, I'm sitting in front of a. No, you make. Of... Well, yeah, you know this. This whole. This whole interview has been amazing. It's it's had me realize to open up my heart more. Not that I don't. 
I try to, but so many things in this world get you down. Like just the littlest stuff, like you said, if you get a bag, I try not to get mad if I get a bad coffee, but you know, like right now, like we're in a world of turmoil. You know what I mean? And yeah. it's hard not to get, I mean, I try to stay away from that for my show. That's why I do a lot on UFOs and aliens. I'll do Bigfoot, whatever it is to steer people away from what's going on in the world, because I want them to be able to come to my show and enjoy, and enjoy things again. Yeah, yeah. Instead well, of watching. Them. I totally yeah. agree. Uh, listen, I'm the same way. I'm the same way. And it, but, you know, it seeps into your work, which is like, what's going on? Why is the planet like in chaos? And I hear it from the flip side. You know, change requires a wee bit of chaos. I had somebody in the book, uh, Hacking the Afterlife. I wasn't there. I didn't film this, but Scott DeTamble shared this session. And then I talked to the guy who gave me permission to use it. But during his Between Life Deep Hypnosis session, he had this memory of like connecting with the earth. And Scott, who conducted the session, said, can I talk to the Earth? Just a question. And the guy was like, yes, you can. <laughs> and so he started asking the Earth questions. Like, does every planet have some entity associated with it? Yes. Everything that exists has an entity associated with it. Answers like that. But... How do you view humans? Like my question with the tree. And Earth kind of said the same thing, which is, look, the Earth has been around a long time, okay? And the Earth is going to be here for a long time. And humans, <laughs> I don't know how else to put it, but he said, but he, he, she, whatever, Earth said, humans are a little bit like bacteria. And you know how you get a cold, you get a fever? and you get really hot, and then you sneeze, and then you feel better. Well, that's yeah. humanity. <laughs> and I yeah, was like, then... really? Oh my God, it's <laughs> not what I wanted to hear. I'm a sneeze. Yeah. But look, when you start to look at things from this perspective, which is, there's nothing that can harm me. No one can harm me. I, Rich, yeah, he'll kick the bucket eventually, even if it's, you know, God forbid, knock on wood, whatever it is, can't harm me. I'm not going anywhere. And when I go back home, I reconnect with the other two thirds that is me, which I've had a little bit of access to in this lifetime, weirdly enough. I know, I kind of know what that's going to be like. It's going to be fine. And, you know, I'll see my friends, we'll hang out, we'll fly, we'll do stuff together. I will miss having a cappuccino, having pizza, and likely I'll get together with my friends and go, hey, what do we got? What's the next play? I don't know. Have you ever been in a play, Robert? Uh, been in one? No. Yeah. You've been to them. Oh, well, our life. I get it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if you think of life as – being on stage, playing a role, and off stage, watching yourself play the role. Robert's not only on stage going around, ah, give me that, what are you doing? Come on, I love you, don't leave me. And then Robert's in the audience going, that was good, I like that, oh, that was, uh, not so good. I'm not so sure about that one. That, oh, that's good. This podcast that he's doing, it's brilliant. He's healing people. That's great. Good job. You see, it's that perspective. Not only are all your relatives applauding you, which is a nice thing to know. Everybody that has ever been on the planet is still accessible and you can talk to them and they'll tell you, you're doing what you signed up for. You're doing a good job. Don't be so hard on yourself. And, but you're on stage, it's a little hard to see that because it's like, you know, when am I going to get the curtain and where's the outfit and my costume's not here? Where's the props? <laughs> Who dropped my props? Right? So, 
Um, I have a couple more questions. Uh, what is the significance of 1111? It's one after 1110. Oh, I'm uh, <clears throat> just kidding. I actually, I can explain that, and not because of my brain, but because of my wife. So uh, we were visiting some relatives in Chicago, and we had to kind of catch a plane the next morning. And our daughter just got a cold, and she was not feeling well, and my wife was afraid we weren't going to be able to fly. And so as she was going to sleep, she was saying a prayer, you know, healing angels, whoever that is, come and help our daughter. And so when she went to sleep, she dreamt about my friend Luana, Luana Anders, who she had met before Luana passed away. And Luana came forward looking like Luana, and she said, everything's going to be okay. Your daughter's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. But my wife, looking at her, said, what are you doing here? You died 20 years ago. How could you be here? And Luana said, think of 1111. We meet at the decimals. And so when she woke up, she told me this dream. She was like, I don't know what that means. Do you have any idea what that means? I went, I do. Because I've heard it consistently in the work. They're in a in a frame they're in another frame let's say another room let's just say hallway number one 11 with the left side of the 11 right over here right they're over there in order to communicate with us with a dream or a drop of something or whatever a smell they've got to slow their frequency down we in order to communicate with them have to speed our frequency up which might be in a dream, might be while we're asleep and there's no other noise around, might be meditating, might be a near-death experience, it might be whatever, filters off. We're not judging and we allow in a dream, generally we're not judging. So in the dream, you've moved your 11 up, they've moved their 11 down and you meet at the decimals. So you can sort of call oh. across the defense. So that 1111, so when people see 1111, listen, you know, 11 minutes after 11 wasn't important when we had analog. I know, I grew up, nobody went around saying, oh my God, it's almost 12 minutes after 11. But because you can see it on a clock, 1111, immediate people do it all the time. Like, oh, that's funny. I just happen to look up at exactly that moment. What I tell people to do is, allow that it's possible that someone on the flip side is tapping you on the shoulder trying to get your attention and then just when i say that who's the first person comes to mind and allow that to be whatever it is i i tried that actually i really tried that the other day when i was kind of meditating i i had like three people well i mean i'm 40 so i've i've reached a point uh, about you don't look a day ago. over 39. Th thank you. <laughs> well, I, I, when I was 30, that's when people close to me started passing away. Well, my dad passed away when I was 21. Oh, I'm sorry. But um, I had an ex-girlfriend pass away. The three people that I really wanted to reach out to were, well, no, one was my dad and then two, my ex-girlfriend. And I just kind of meditated and I asked them a question. And then I waited, I waited, and it seemed like I got a response, like, right away. What was the response? You know what I mean? Um, it, it was just like, I just said, hi, how are you doing? I said, Carly, how are you doing? She was like, I'm fine. <laughs> that was right. it. Now, if, if you had just done it alone by yourself, which you did, you were alone, you would naturally think, oh, that's what I would expect her to say. Okay. Except when you talk to your friend Rich, and I tell you, that's the first thing they always say. Because people, the first question they go is, how are you? And they always say, I'm fine. Or, I'm okay, how are you? That's what happened in both cases. So, so allow that. And people, and what I tell people is don't judge the answers. Just don't judge them. So what you do is, and I'm going to give you a technique, Robert, so you can use it. 
don't judge the answers. Write it down. Get a pen, you know, pencil and piece of paper. Write down. I'm fine. Next question. Ask questions you don't know the answer to or could not. Carly, who was the first person to greet you when you crossed over? What comes to mind? Yeah, well, I drew a blank right there. But, okay. You know, Dad, like, who was there to greet you when you crossed over? I just thought of my great-grandfather. Okay, don't judge it. Write that down. Right? You write it down. Then you okay. go on from there. You say, um, what's the food that you miss most about being on the planet? Is there a food or anything you miss? What comes to mind? Yeah. What does he say? Pizza. Pizza. <laughs> He's a good Italian. Well, that, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's your mom. Sorry. Yeah, pizza. Okay, don't judge it. And you keep asking these questions, okay? When you hear an answer before you can ask the question, then you know you've made a connection. You see? You'll be sitting there yeah. with your list of questions and you'll start to ask and you'll hear pizza. And you go, oh, I was gonna ask you, what do you miss? That's their way, because they're outside of time. They can anticipate what you're going to ask. They can see how your brain is working. They can do that. So that's a way of verification. You do the same thing with Carly, and you do the same thing with your dad, and it, just keep doing it. And what I recommend is uh, you can add flavors, like a photograph, take a photograph out, put the photograph aside, remember when it was taken, and try to set aside emotions. We can, can't help, but try to set them aside. And just focus on that day the photograph was taken, what they look like, the sound of their voice. And then, and then you can ask simple questions. Is this you? Where, where are you? They always answer, I'm here. <laughs> I'm right next to you. Um, you ask, who are you hanging out with? Are you and my dad hanging out with? Are you hanging out together? Did you guys know each other? Did I know you in a previous lifetime? If so, could you show it to me? Is there something I need to know that you want to tell me? Is there something you want me to tell other members of the family on your behalf? And when you hear something like that, I recommend, you know, finding the right way to say it without saying, you know, I was talking to dad last night and he told me to tell you to like snap out of it. They don't want to hear that. That happened to me. My dad passed away, and the night he passed, I literally felt his hand on my shoulder. And I heard his voice in my ear, and he said, I'm experiencing indescribable joy. And I was like, I'd never heard him talk like that. And then I said, and then he said, you need to wake up and write something down. And I went, if I get up, I'll lose it. You know, just tell me. And he said, no, write it down. So I got to turn the light, got a pencil and the paper, turned the light off and listened. And he said, I want you to tell your mother I'm here with, and he named six individuals. Couple I knew, couple I didn't. Then he had specific messages for my brother, each one of them, each brother. Tell him to do this. Really? Tell him to do this. Yeah, very, a of a connection. very specific. And I mean, I could hear his voice clear as a bell. And at the end of this long missive of answers, I said, why are you telling me all this? You're like, why aren't you telling them if you can tell me, right? And he said simply, because you can hear me. Meaning your filters are altered, you know, when you got hit in the head with a baseball or, you know, put playing football those years, your filters are off, whatever. So the next day I told my, I said to my mom, um, dad told me to tell you this, and she went, uh-huh. And I said, so do you know who these people are, A, B, C, D, F, G? She said, oh, those are our friends who died in World War II. Wow. People I didn't know could not have known, but he knew, and he knew she would know. But then I went to my brothers, and I said, you know, dad told me to tell you this, and they went, get out of here. Shut up. You didn't talk to dad. Screw you. <laughs> that's, that's what their reaction was. 
And I realized yeah. you have to couch it. You have to put it in terms that they can comprehend or allow, which is to say, listen, I had this weird dream last night. I don't know if it was real. I don't know if it wasn't real, but I had the impression that I heard dad's voice and he told me to tell you this. Now, I don't know what that means. Stop drinking. <laughs> but but you know, it, might, it probably means something to you. I mean, one of my brothers, it was very specific, you know, stop doing that. And he told me at the time to go to hell. And then he told me later on, he thought about it and he stopped. So whatever. Allow. And then I also tell people, go to the place that they used to like to hang out at. So Carly had a favorite restaurant, right? Yeah. Or should, there was a place that she liked to go on the beach or, you know, to go with you, whatever. Yeah. Go there. Talk about them in present tense. Well, I'm here. What do you think? How's this? Blah, blah, blah. Just like they're there. And you'll, you'll see. The more you do it, the more you opened up the door, the more things will start coming through that happen before you can think them. The more answers start coming through before you can ask them. The more lottery numbers, nah, they never come. <laughs> I always ask, where are the lottery numbers? You never know. And then we're not, I guess we're not supposed to leave the lottery. Well, that's what they say. They laugh. I always, when I get to a council, I'm with these people, you know, and they're very serious and they're like, I'm seeing my eternal guide and I'm seeing this thing. And I go, can I ask you questions? And they'll say, they say it's okay. And then I'll say, all right, so Friday's lottery. What are the numbers? <laughs> they always <laughs> laugh. And then sometimes they all, I've had councils shout out different numbers. Two, 27, 16, 42. Because they're mocking me, you know. Yeah. That's and true. they have a sense of humor. But, you know, here's the point. It, if you won all the money in the world tomorrow, we wouldn't be talking about this, would we? No. No. You'd be doing something else. I'd be doing something else. No, actually, I think I still would do this podcast because I love talking to people. <laughs> I really like doing this, you know. I, I might do it on a bigger scale somehow, you know. Well, that's what I tell people, you know. Um People ask me, so, you know, I'm a filmmaker. And they're like, well, you know, why are you doing this? What is this? What, why are you doing this stuff? And I go, look, I had somebody come up to me and say, after reading Flipside, she said, I wanted to look you in the eye and say, thank you for saving my life. Because, you know, she was suicidal over the loss of her daughter. And by following those steps, she had a connection with her daughter again. And that saved her life. And I thought... I am never going to get that as a review. That's never going to show up on IMDb. This guy saved my life. Not that, the, you know, it wasn't me saving her life. It was the research, the idea that I'm filming this stuff. But yeah, you start to realize you're here for a reason. Um, sometimes it's hard to figure out why and why. I mean, so what, what, what amazed me, and what amazed me about all this is, um, how how big of a scale everything's on how grandiose this really is number one that everything's sentient number two that there are extraterrestrial beings and like whatever you want to call it the afterlife yeah. and that they're all a part of this and i just have a feeling the reason why we can't communicate with them why we see ufos well i've never actually seen one but i think why we can't communicate with them is I, I don't know why. I well, I'll give sure. you an example. So <clears throat> it was about, I don't know, a couple of years ago, somebody had read one of my books. They cornered me in a coffee shop and we just started talking. And he said, well, I had a, you know, abduction experience when I was in my 20s. This guy's in his 50s. And he told this story. He was with somebody else. And they came out and they saw a UFO and an hour went by and he didn't remember anything. And it freaked him out. And it freaked his friend out. But I said, well, let's, and I was using the same technique, which is what's the memory? What do you remember? And let's freeze it. If you can holograph it, turn it into a hologram, then there's no emotion associated with it. So like, you know, you mentioned seeing your dad or having a dream where your dad's there. Yeah. You freeze it when you want to remember it. Go back to the moment before you realized, oh, you're not alive and they disappear. 
you just go to the, and so I did that with him. He froze the object in space. And then I said, okay, now go up to the object because it's a hologram. You can move it closer to you and touch it. What does it feel like? He could do that. I said, now go inside this spacecraft. How many people are in here? How many beings? 100, 10, three, three. Go to the pilot, non-denominational. What is the pilot? Do you know this pilot? And then I said, can I ask the pilot questions? Sure. Are you just flying by? Are you on a tour? I mean, did you come all this way to sort of check out the earth? He said, no, I'm here to see my friend. And from there, I had a discussion with this person about the flip side. In, on my webpage, martinizone.com, you'll see there's an interview with Heather Wade. Heather Wade oh, took I love over. Heather Wade, she's awesome. Yeah, she's great. And there's an interview with her where she had a near-death experience and she walked me into the near-death experience and we had the same council discussions that we do. But then two years later, I wrote to her because I was transcribing it for the book and I said, how are you doing? And she said, well, Art Bell had died recently and I'm not doing so well. And I said, well, she said, well, I'd love to have you on the show. So I went on the show. And on the show, which is on my website, copy of it, it's in the book, Architecture of the Afterlife, we interview Art Bell. And at some point, Art Bell interviews me because Aww. she says to me, she says, Rich, this is gonna sound weird, but Art wants to ask you a question. And I thought, yeah, great, of course. He said, why can't I communicate with her? There's all this time that I've tried to reach to her but I can't get through it or this is Heather saying this to me that she's seeing art and he's asking her this question. And I said, well, it's very hard to create sound waves. It's much easier to do images. And she said, when I said that, it's like he downloaded about 20 different times where weird things had happened to her where that was him trying to reach out to her because she felt like a, like she broke her ankle and she felt a hand on her ankle trying to heal it. And he said, yeah, that was me. I'm just not very good at it. But then I asked Art about his, about what it was like over there on the flip side. He said he's interviewing people like Whitley Stryber, but not consciously. So he's interviewing Whitley Stryber's higher self. He'll go visit his pal Whitley. They'll have a conversation. Whitley will wake up the next day and go, oh, I feel like I was talking to Art last night. Have no conscious memory of it. And then I asked him if he had had any lifetimes on other planets. And he goes through a number of them. And so does Heather. The idea being, and this I would offer to you, there's no coincidence that you have some um, interest in talking about people on other planets. It's likely that either you've had an experience going there or someone in your immediate family has had a lifetime there. I'll give you an example. I, I got a call from a film producer, jaded Hollywood guy, very successful, big, big blockbusters. And he said, there's a the actress in my office who's talking like you, talking about this afterlife stuff. So I went over to see her and it was very strange. It's a chapter in architecture of the afterlife, but I just started asking her questions and she had had a UFO experience. And because of that, I was able to do the same thing. Freeze the frame. Let's go into the ship. Let's talk to the people aboard the ship. Or are you just flying by? She then proceeded to describe a lifetime that she's still living on another planet because in the other planet, they live for 5,000 years. Wow. That she's had a number of lifetimes here on this planet. And the reason is she's reporting. She's a science officer on this other planet. And they sent her here against her will, according to her. At the time, she was like, I hate it here. I hate it on the planet. I don't like this place. I have a family, but I'm here. I'm stuck here on the earth, passing along information back to them. So every time a ship shows up and they get scanned, that's upload. That's an upload of information. 
And I ask, wow. why? What are you doing it for? And, and they all say, roughly, and some version of it, we're trying to help humans shift consciousness so that they can communicate with us without thinking of us as aliens. We've just done it. That's amazing. That's amazing. This has been amazing. This, I, I, this opened up my mind so much to like everything, different ideas of thinking. And I, I wanted to know about the afterlife. I didn't know. Uh, I mean, I, I watched some of your interviews on Beyond Belief to get to help me get prepared. I just for came this. back from there a couple of days ago. I just flew to go. Oh, it was great. It was great. It'll be out in a month or so. I mean, I really didn't want to go. I kept saying, can't we do it on Skype or, you know, on Zoom? No. So they flew me in and I went on and George, he was great. And uh, he tried to throw me some curveballs. It was interesting because it was funny because speaking of, speaking of aliens, he said, you interviewed J. Allen Hynek in a recent interview with Jennifer Schaefer, and I did. It's on my website, Martini Zone. What's really strange about that, Robert, is that I'm live on the air on Sunday, last Sunday. George says, you interviewed an old friend of mine, J. Allen Hynek, on the flip side, asked him about his journey. He said, I'm friends with his son. Do you think you really talked to J. Allen Hynek? And when we came back from the clip that he showed, when I was 14 years old, a nun in my school wanted me to do a science project, so she introduced me to J. Allen Hynek. He came over to my house, and I remember him smoking a pipe. And he was sitting there, he'd smoke it while he was talking to me. Now, I didn't follow him that much. I mean, years later, I realized, oh, he was the guy who wrote Project Blue Book. So his name popped into my head, and I did an interview with him on the flip side with Jennifer Schaefer asking him about his journey. So this was last Sunday. I get on the plane, I fly home. My wife says, let's watch Close Encounters. And I say, oh, I've already seen that movie. You know, I've seen it before. She puts it on, it's a completely different movie. He's completely re-edited, it's a new version. It totally makes sense now. And as I'm watching it, I look it up online and I realize, J. Allen Hynek worked on this film. He was the guy who invented the term close encounters. And then I look at the screen and there he is. I recognize him from when I saw him when I was 15 or 14 years old. And he puts a pipe in his mouth. And I was there, it, literally we were talking about him three yeah. hours before and now there he is. So on my blog, richmartini.com, there's an extensive story of how that occurred and how coincidental, and maybe not coincidental, that J. Allen Hynek, the guy who invented Close Encounters, popped into my consciousness and into my living room 50 years later. Um, I'm, I'm interested in going back. And, I'm, a, I'm a huge Art Bell fan. I mean, when you brought up that Art Bell thing, that wasn't, I, mean, I don't think things happen by coincidence. So that's one of the reasons why I do this, because I admire Art Bell. And, uh, so that was good to hear art, you know, like I was really sad when he passed. No, well, here's the thing. I, you know, my experience with art was like anybody else. I was driving on California in the seventies and I heard him late night radio, like, what is this? And then somewhere along the line, art invited me on a show and he had Heather, who was his assistant at the time, call me up and say, art wants you on the show back when he was doing his show after he had done left coast to coast. I was like, sure, that'd be great. But then two years went by, nothing. You know, he never called back. And then Heather called me again and said, well, I'm doing the show now. And Art suggested you as a guest. And I was like, great. So I went on and did the show. You'll hear it when you hear the thing. And then in the interim, he passed away. And so now when we suggested doing this, I, I don't think I said, let's talk to Art. But I said to her, maybe we can talk to art and so now we're doing this thing live on the air and she says i'm so excited because i have the feeling we might talk to art and what i do is i just say okay look around you who do you see what do you see and we went through a whole thing we talked to her guides we you know we reconnected with the flip side as we had two years earlier and her oh. guide was saying 
you know my name. Why are you asking me? I told you two years ago. And suddenly she goes, oh my God, Rich, he's standing in front of me. I can see his like gene, his faded gene. He's right here. Art is right here. It's really dramatic. And wow. I just, you know, because I've done this so much, I kind of just go, okay, well, Art was there to greet you when you crossed over. And I got to say, he had so many, um, you know, really intense fans that when I finished the show, people were claiming that Heather had an earpiece and was talking to a medium who was talking to Art simultaneously. You know, it was like a really convoluted thing of like how we had invented this interview, which yeah. as best as I could, I wrote comments to all those people to say, look, I've been doing this a long time. I didn't know Heather. I've, been, I'd have never met Heather, but I've met her twice online over the course of two or three hours and she's great and very cool and she's the one who accessed art i didn't i couldn't see him i couldn't hear him but he answered everything completely in line with other people say you know i asked him so i think cats were what greeted him on the flip side and it was like when he saw the cats he realized Oh, I know these cats. So you're not thinking like, where am I? You're like, oh, I know those cats. So it's like, it shifts Art your frequency. Cats. Did he? Yeah, I didn't he know that. Cats. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. You're telling me something new. But it shifts, it gives you a soft landing because you realize, oh, I know these cats. I have nothing to fear, right? I'm looking at these yeah. cats. And then you start to see other people. And then he said he, he walks around a lot. He said he goes around because you can. And he just, you know, it's easy to walk. And you can walk anywhere on the planet or other planets. But, you know, Earth's a fun place to walk. So he says yeah. that he was doing that. Now, here's the really weird part. I said, so what are you doing over there? He said, I constructed a sound booth. So he's doing radio shows. And as Heather put it, I, listen, I, Heather was, couldn't have possibly thought this out in advance, but he was saying everything's analog. So what he does is he, he creates all the wires. You remember how studios used to be built, right? The sound, you yeah. know, the board and everything. You plug the stuff in, you got to know. Where, so you have to mentally construct all the pieces of the soundboard. And then you have, you know, the tapes that you pop in, right? He said, I, I know where all the tapes are. I said, well, what kind of music do you listen to? He said, it's all music from my memory. I recreate the songs completely. And I said, so who do you broadcast to? Are you broadcasting? Like, do we have to tune you in? You know, this is our bell from the flip side. He said, yeah. it doesn't really work that way. It just makes him comfortable to be in that room because that's kind of like heaven to him, you know in a room where he can yeah. bring people in yeah. and do interviews. He's not interested in, you know, saving it on a D, you know, CD or DVD or analog. But that I'm going to go listen to that interview. That that's on your website? Uh yeah. If you look up Heather Wade and my website, there's two interviews. I think uh I might have used some footage from a trip to India because you're not looking at anything, you know, it's just a voice, right? So you'll see some wacky footage that yeah. I shot when I was in India, but you'll hear the interview. And it's pretty much three hours of each. And it's in the book, Architecture of the Afterlife. What if I, what if I, Google, what if I Google Rich Martini and Heather Wade? Will that come <laughs> I'll up? feel it. I'll feel it if you do that. Don't do that. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, martinizone.com takes you right okay. there. Okay. Well, also, thank you so much. Oh, go you're ahead, welcome. Go ahead. Also, Architecture of the Afterlife. So, okay. And you can listen to it on Audible, where I read all of Heather's responses, and I do Art Bell's voice. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. You made You're my welcome, night, everyone. honestly. You really <laughs> did. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Have a good night.